It's over opinionated. Welcome back to another episode of Over Opinionated. Today's date is June 19th, 2023, and let's get started with our episode. So you might say, why did you wait 19 days to do this video, Josh, in the month of June? Because we were addressing other topics in the previous episodes, which were important, but every day in the month of June is a gimmick for companies to put rainbows on things so that they can sell them to consumers and the LGBT community. I want to address the idea of June being Pride Month. They made they made it Pride Month because this is when the landmark decision of the gay marriage case, which is known as a Burgerfeld, which was decided on June 26, 2015, when the Supreme Court decided that same-sex marriage was now recognized in all 50 states. And um, this has some big ramifications when it comes to, you know, who gets to determine who can get married and who sets marriage law within the states or the federal government. Um, I don't want to talk about just marriage in the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court releases quite a bit. Uh, the Supreme Court does release decisions in June. It also released the uh, overturner, overturn of Roe v. Wade in June, and a lot of pro-life Christians are saying, maybe we should call this Life Month. Um, there is no official holiday or official month of Pride Month, thankfully, in the United States, but you wouldn't be able to tell it because everything is a rainbow everywhere you go, which is very ironic if you know the meaning of the rainbow <laughs> in the Bible. But um, first of all, I want to state off um, a lot of people hate uh, when you bring in religion into this conversation. They'll say separation of church and state, even if I'm just criticizing the culture and not the government. <laughs> if I criticize a corporation, and is that me forcing religion on you? And we've had this conversation before. So, um, even from a secular standpoint, though, you can make the case that same-sex marriage is not good for the country, and it's not good for um, the growth of the family, which helps the country. Even with that being said, I want to take a look at the culture and we're going to take a look at how the government influences the culture. And then we're going to get down to the brass tacks of the Bible about what the Bible says about pride and what the Bible says about the uh, LGBT movement. And as you know, if you have hung out with me or if you've talked to me, this does not look good for them. But I just want to clarify something real quick. Never let your faith in God be overshadowed by someone else's sin so much that you are fully focused on that sin. Now, it's easier in Pride Month because everyone is shoving a rainbow down your throat. But these are still people that can be won to Christ Jesus, that can their souls can be saved. My problem isn't with the fact that people struggle with sexual sins. Everyone under the sun struggles with sexual sins, and if they tell you that they're not, then they're more than likely lying, or they're, they're a very rare case. I mean, extraordinarily rare case. Almost everyone has sex before they're married. Almost everyone has looked at a woman with lust, or looked at a man with lust. Um, I've never had the... I've never had homosexual temptation. But I've had a lot of other sexual temptation, and all sex outside of marriage 
is a sin. So I'm not going to stand here and be hypocritical and say I am sinless in this department because I'm not, you're not, no one is. That's why we need Jesus' forgiveness. That's why we need his grace. But the problem we have here isn't just a sexual sin problem. It's a pride problem. And pride is one of the worst sins. It's what threw Lucifer out of heaven. Pride destroys us. Never be proud of a sin. And I've prayed before if I've um, if I'm proud of a sin, God, take that away from me. I'm a sinner, okay? I sin every day, and I will until the day I die because I fall in temptation. But I have the Holy Spirit that helps me, that loves me, that will forgive me if I abide in Him. Now, that doesn't mean that I go out and I try to willfully sin, although I may at times fall down. Okay, I'm a sinner. I just want to, everyone should know that. Your pastor behind the pulpit, if he admits it or not, is a sinner. <laughs> uh, your grandma, your mom, the post person you love the most on this planet is a sinner. Now, they might be a sinner that's redeemed by grace that makes them now a saint. A, but that doesn't mean that they don't have sin in their life. Okay, and the Holy Spirit has to expose that, help us to combat it, because we can't do it by ourselves. But my problem here is not sexual sin by itself. It's the pride of sexual sin, which destroys us. And I want to play you a clip. You might not understand everything going on, but this is a clip from the White House of the LGBT Pride Parade. And in this clip, there is a transgender female, so a biological male that was born a male, who is now a transgender female. So a male that believes he's a female. They, uh, whoever had, whatever surgeon he had, was a very good surgeon because looking down the street you wouldn't be able to tell that this is a man but it is actually a man that looks a lot like a woman at the white house taking his top off with fake breast being exposed and this is the a disgrace to our country this is happening on the white house lawn at least Bill Clinton had the decency to, to do things behind closed doors. It was still wrong. I'm not saying that there's been things that haven't been sinful at the White House. There has. But this is wrong. We are saying we are a nation that prides ourselves in the sin of pride. That we are prideful in our sin. That has ramifications for the whole country. Not just Washington, D.C., not just the Democrat Party, not just the Biden administration. Because Joe Biden is the duly elected president of the United States, which everyone almost, well, I'd say everyone listening to this podcast is a citizen of, unless you're tuning in from another country like Canada. But I doubt it. Most of y'all are Americans. This is something we have to deal with is Americans, and it reflects on us. It doesn't matter if we voted for him or not. He's our president. We have to pray repentance. We have to get involved and vote for good people. Now, that doesn't mean he's not your president. He is. There are wicked presidents. There are wicked kings. We still have to submit to their role and their governance. But I want to play you a clip here about um, the White House 2023 Pride Parade. Happy Pride Month. Can we take a little video? Hi, Mr. President. It is an honor. France rights and human rights. We're gathered here today to honor the extraordinary, and I'm not being solicitous, the extraordinary courage and contribution of the LGBTQ community to celebrate their legacy and their progress. 
We welcome to the largest Pride Month celebration ever held at the White House, but just the beginning. But for all the progress we made, we know, we know real change and real challenges still remain. When a person can be married in the morning and thrown out of a restaurant for being gay in the afternoon, something is still very wrong in America. <laughs> That's why the Congress must pass and send me the Equality Act to qualify protections for the LGBT community. So today, I want to send a message to the entire community, especially to transgender children. You are loved. You are heard. You are understood. And you belong. And as I made clear, including in my State of the Union address, your president, my entire administration, has your back. There you heard it um, from President Joe Biden. And uh, what's concerning is they always go to love. Uh, they'll say love is love. And why are you against love? Well, saying love is love is a bumper sticker slogan. That's like saying my body, my choice. That's like saying uh, my... Um, my body, my choice, that's a lie. Babies don't choose to die. That doesn't mean much. It's a bumper sticker slogan. Water is water. That's true. I have a cup of water right next to me. It's good to drink. I'm not going to drink out of my toilet, though. Water is water. Um, would you say love is love with a 30-year-old and a 14-year-old? Mm, I don't... Maybe... It, it, maybe it's coming. Uh, would you say love is love with a brother and a sister? Would you say love is love with uh, two closely related people? Um, love is love. I love people, okay? Conservatives never wanted you to not love people. They never passed one law that said you can't love a gay person. Now, what this boils down to is... What is marriage? And, and conservatives believe that marriage is between a man and a woman in a biblical framework. And sometimes it was a man and multiple women, but it was always men and women. Okay. Joe Biden couldn't even name every letter in the LGBT community. Let me read you every letter real quick. All right, here we go. I'm going to probably have to take a break. It is L G B T Q Q I P S two A. Oh, I even messed it up. <laughs> it's so long. It's let me do it one more time. L G B T Q Q I P two S A. My goodness. If you have to take a breath in the middle of an alcr an acronym, maybe you should shorten it a little. <laughs> okay, let's get down to brass tacks. The LGBTQ plus community will say, we have, you aren't recognizing our love if you don't recognize our marriage, if you don't recognize this, this, and this. Let's not even think about the marriage part. If you don't, if you're not gay affirming, if you're not an ally. I used to have to take a test every year at work. It was a diversity training test. And at the end of the test, I aced all of it because it's basically, don't be a jerk. But then at the very end, it gets into the LGBT stuff. And it says, do you consider yourself an ally? And what they mean by ally is, do you agree with all my political positions about the LGBT community? Do you agree about all the positions that the LGBT have? And if you don't, you're a bigot. And I always hit no. Um... And maybe I could have gotten in trouble for that. I don't care. I am not an ally. My word has to be on the word of God. Even if you want to separate that for a little bit and go secular, which I ain't really into. But if I have to for five seconds because you don't know the definition of separation of church and state, which was a letter wrote down by the Tom, by Thomas Jefferson by the Danbury Baptist Association, not found in the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, by the way. If I have to play secularist for just a little bit, 
you know, I'm going to say, pardon me, the libertarian part, which I'm not a big libertarian, but I do like the idea that as long as you're not hurting me, do what you want to in the own confines of your house. I'm not going to come and beat you up in your house with a Bible, okay? But you're not leaving it in the privacy of your bedroom. You're posting it on every wall. You're posting it everywhere. You've got drag queens out in the street in pride parades. You're chopping off little kids' balls. And you're make, trying to make them girls. You're chopping off girls' breasts and trying to make them boys. And they're not boys. And they're not girls. You are what you were born as. That doesn't make me a bigot. That's biologically true. And then you play word games. Games and you say sex is not gender and gender is not sex they're different you made up this whole new term to be right you're playing you're playing gymnastics you're playing mental gymnastics to be right and you're screwing up an entire generation of people that you know what if i grew up in a generation more like this and a family that wasn't as biblically rooted you know, when I told my grandma growing up, you know, I think it'd be cool to be a girl. Instead of her saying, well, Josh, you were born with balls and God made you a boy. Guess what? If I had a, a woke granny, she might have went down and to the clinic and got my parents' permission after a few minutes and chopped them off. And now, obviously, I'm sure that there's... Uh, paperwork you have to go through and everything. And I've, I know psychologists will say it's gender-affirming health care. It's to help people with their mental health. Listen, you're not helping them with their mental health. You're hurting them. You're saying you're not the thing you were born as. If someone suffers with gender dysphoria, let's love them and help them and not carve them up like the thanksgiving turkey you might say i'm being graphic you might say i'm being mean i'm saying i love these people and i'm tired of people taking advantage of them for political purposes they're small children after you eight after you're 18 do what you want but these small children should not be carved up and it is wrong and any state that allows it is dead wrong I don't care if your parent says it's okay. I don't care if your grandparent says it's okay. If your guardian says it's okay. The state should have the moral fortitude to say, we're not carving up our children. I am tired of seeing it. It's wrong. And you might say it's not the majority. You might see it's just a bare minority. But those bare minority kids are going to grow up confused. They're going to grow up in a body that God didn't give them. They're going to grow up trying to be the opposite gender or sex, whatever word you want to use. That they're not. And I have all the love in the world for people that suffer with this condition. I have all the love in the world for people that struggle with homosexuality. But instead of raising up a flag, instead of going to the White House, why don't we say, I need help? Why don't we say, I need forgiveness? I need love. Okay, I will love you. I will do my best. I will love you. I will pray for you. I, would, I wouldn't be mean to you if you sat in the pew next to me, if you work next to me. I will be nice to you. I will treat you like the human being you are because anyone with a breath left in their lungs can repent and go to heaven. And I'm tired of people that live in the LGBT community having to live like this and having a society that says they accept them while we we say we accept them with our lips, we don't really care about them. We use them for political pawns. That's wrong. I'm going to get my Bible app to read you a couple of verses from the Bible. We're going to start in Levit Leviticus 18. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, Leviticus says a lot of things. I bet you still eat shrimp and they'll find all of these things in there. There's a difference between moral laws and the sacrimonial laws that the Jewish people had to keep. We no longer have to keep the sacramental laws. The Jewish laws were for Israel. 
They weren't for the Gentile nations. But there were still laws in the Old Testament that applied to the entire world, not just Israel. So, but listen, people that come up with these things, they, they don't care what the text says. They don't care really what the Bible says. They'll try to find this, this, this. They'll nitpick the Bible to try to make God sound awful and try to make Christianity sound bad. But it's a heart condition. But I'm still going to play you something in Leviticus because I think it's I think it's important. Then we're going to go to the New Testament for y'all guys that don't like the Old Testament. But listen, the Old Testament's still important for Christianity today. It's still important for this world today. So we shouldn't reject it. We have to know the difference between Jewish law and the law of the nations. But I'm going to play you a clip here from the Bible app and the NIV from Leviticus 18. Leviticus chapter 18. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord, your God. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter, or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife born to your father. She is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. Do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are her close relatives. That is wickedness. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Moloch. For you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native-born and the foreigners residing among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, 
It will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their people. Keep my requirements, and do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came, and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord, your God. That is all Leviticus of, chapter uh, nine. That is all Leviticus chapter 18. And I'm sorry if the audio didn't work out great, but I thought it came in pretty good. I played the whole chapter so someone could say I'm not picking and choosing. I explained the difference between Jewish law and the laws that we should keep today. And in and, and Leviticus 18, it says all will be judged by this. Now, that's not the only sin. Homosexuality is not the only sin. Transgenderism is not the only sin in that. But this is the sin, this is the pride that is being celebrated. I have sexual sin. Everyone does. Okay? We repent of that. We ask God to forgive us. He shows us the law because we couldn't live up to the law. But we can't be prideful. I, I'm going to... Pay us, or I'm going to read us a verse of what pride does. I'm going to read you a verse from Proverbs 16. Is Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Listen, guys, this is it's dangerous. The sinful part, the sexual sin is bad enough. It's the pride that will destroy us. It's the same fall that Lucifer had was pride. And they literally took the rainbow. How stupid. How how ignorant can you be? Not ignorant because you know it's a spit in God's face. You take the rainbow, which is the covenant between God and us, that there will not be a flood again. <laughs> That God saved the human race through Noah, through the ark. And gave us the sign that he would not destroy the earth with a flood. And gave us the rainbow. And then human beings took the rainbow, which is God's covenant and his promise to us. And made it about sin. Now... Now, you might say, I don't believe the Bible. And in that case, I really can't do much for you. But if you do believe the Bible, you can't argue with these verses. I've never heard one good argument. They have progressive Christianity to say, well, it was mistranslated. That's such a cop-out. We can go back to the Greek, and homosexual would be men laying with men. Okay, you can say that the fall of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't about homosexuality and that that was just a practice. Raping uh, visitors was a practice of inhospitality and it was a practice toward foreigners. Listen, I don't think homosexuality is the only reason that destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah at all. And there is truth that rape um, is... Um, was practiced as a show of humiliation. But the biggest, but well, I'm not going to say the biggest, one of the biggest sins we see in that story is homosexuality and rape. And God's destroyed that city. And I know it's not the only sin, but that's the sin that God highlights. It's one of them. Now, unfriendly, Toward foreigners, toward uh, unfriendly, toward um, wanderers. Yeah, that's true too. But listen, I don't want to go back to shaming gay people. I don't want to go back to the way the church mishandled it. We as a church mishandled homosexuality and elevated above all other sins. That was wrong. Homosexuality is no different than having sex before marriage. And that might hurt a lot of my listeners because a lot of my listeners are against homosexuality. 
that have had sex before marriage. Okay, uh, obviously there's a different pride factor, but they are the same type of sin. Now, you can repent of that sin. I have. Many of you have. Okay, my problem isn't with the sexual sin that we struggle and fight with daily or any sin. If you if you come to me and you say, Josh, I was born a homosexual. I love God. I know this is a sin. I know this is wrong. But I can't stop thinking about this. I would have a serious conversation with him. I would love him. I don't know if God would want have him celibate or if God would get him out of that. But I do believe God can get you out of it. But I do believe sometimes not everyone's called to marriage and a lot of people are called to celibacy. And celibacy is not a curse. We have to stop treating celibacy like a curse. Okay? Paul says um, that celibacy is better to serve God in because you're not um, having to be tied down with the wife and kids. Now, not everyone is called to celibacy, but um, but we are in this culture that if you are celibate or if you're single, that you're less of a man, you're less of a woman. That's not what the Bible says. That's what the world says, and we got to stop thinking like that. It's a wrong thing to think. It's wrong. I'm not better than anyone else because I'm married. The, Am I better just after I said, after a few months ago when I got married and I said I do? Am I a better person after I said I do and kissed my wife than I was a few minutes ago? No. I was married to the love of my life then, but I was not a better person than I was after that. I was still a sinner that needed God's grace. Now, for all of those that might say the Old Testament condemns homosexuality, but the New Testament doesn't, I'm going to go to what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans, and then I'm going to uh, give a short little debunk or um, of what people f will say that means in the first chapter of the book of Romans by the Apostle Paul. This is the first chapter and the 18th verse of the book of Romans as we listen in to the Bible app, the U version, that's what I'm using, and uh, the international, the new international version. Verse 18 is where we're starting off. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Rome. That's really um, condemning of homosexuality. If we go back, uh, go back to uh, chapter 1 here, it says um, that even the women... Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for thereof. Okay, now uh, some gay, some gay affirming quote unquote Christians will say that that is a person that is attracted to a female that rejects that and experiments or has sex with another man. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. You shouldn't either. They're playing, they're literally just playing mental gymnastics. Okay, and when the Bible says natural relations, what I think that means is what God planned for nature. I understand a lot of people will say, this is how I naturally feel, and it, it probably is. Okay, you might feel like you were born this way. You might have been about that to a certain degree. I just care about what is sinful or not sinful. People are born with tendencies to do certain things some of those things are sinful some people are born that steal things that is ingrained in them it's still a sin homosexuality is a sin transgenderism is a sin the bible calls it cross-dressing but the left doesn't care about the bible they'll say separation of church and state and um and listen, I want a separation of church and state. I don't want the Episcopal Church being the official church of the United States. I don't want the Pentecostal Church to be the official church of the United States. There's a difference in a separation of church and state and a separation of Christ and state. And what the left wants is a separation of Christ and state. They don't want Bible-believing Christians to be able to pull the lever the same way they do for people with the same values that they have, even though they can go pull the lever for a secular person with secular values. Christians should vote biblically. In, in the town halls, when they go vote for their candidates, Christian delegates, Christian congressmen, Christian senators, Christian presidents should act like a Christian delegate, like a Christian uh, legislator, like a Christian president. Christians should act like Christians. You might say you're forcing my religion on you. Well, listen, we've been over this. If I run as a biblical Christian and say I'm going to follow the Bible as closely as I can, as I, if I run on the Constitution, if I run on the Bible, and I get voted in with a 51% more majority, that is not forced. That is what the will of the people is, and elections have consequences. Just like when you vote in your secular person, we have the consequences of sitting out through their crap. Now, that means that doesn't mean that I'm not inconsiderate. That doesn't mean I'm inconsiderate to your concerns. I am. That doesn't mean I don't represent you. I do. That doesn't mean I don't want to help you if a certain thing comes about. But if I know what the Word of God says, who am I to say that I am smarter than God's Word? That is not me forcing a religion on you. 
That's not me saying you have to go to church. You still have the freedom of speech. You still have the freedom of worship. You can still run a candidate that has the exact opposite values as me and beat me. But that is not a violation of separation of church and state. And have you even read the First Amendment and everyone that keeps saying that? Some of them have. Some of them have. Some I know the political p opponents have, but have all these activists that hold up signs saying separation of church and state. Have you even read the First Amendment? Do you know where that term comes from? That's what drives me crazy. We can't just say because I'm a Christian, I'm not going to vote my values. I'm going to let God judge us. This is not out of hate. This is out of love. This is out of concern for our country and concern for gay and trans people i love them i want them to repent of their sins and go to heaven just like when i had to make a decision in 2012 if i was going to follow christ or not and god hit me hard on sexual sin and lust and other sins in my life that i knew i was wrong even though i knew even though I grew up with my grandfather being a Pentecostal holiness minister, even though I grew up in church, even though I grew up with a Bible, I did not have a personal relationship with him. I had to do mental gymnastics to say this was okay, just like people now are doing. you got to repent. You have to say Jesus is Lord. You have to say Jesus is King. You have to say I'm a sinner and I need his forgiveness. And guess what? I sinned a lot after that day, after I asked God to forgive me. And I sin a lot every day. And I'm ashamed of it, and I ask God to forgive me. I have done things I am ashamed of. So if you want to hold a magnifying glass up to me, thinking I'm the standard, I am not the standard. But listen to me, please. Don't look at my life and say, is Josh a hypocrite? I'll save you the time. I am. But so are you because everyone under the sun is a hypocrite. We That's why we need God's grace and forgiveness. And I'm calling to you to repent. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. Me, Josh Scott, deserves to die and go to hell for his sins. Now, some of the people might say, I, I listen to your show, I like you, Josh, you're not that bad. The smallest, smallest, minute sin that we think is okay, it was bad enough that God sent his son to die for me, and I need his forgiveness. Now, I'm trying my best not to live in a life of sin, and I think that God's helping me grow and helping me with his Holy Spirit. Now, I want to also say something. June is also men, Men's Mental Health Month. How many people have seen men's mental health being promoted in June versus Pride Month? My wife bought me flowers because it was Men's Mental Health Month and because she loves me. And she told me something which is true. She said, most men don't get flowers till their funeral. I want you to know that you are loved now. I have a good wife. I have a godly wife. She might not be perfect, but I don't need a perfect wife. I need one that loves me. And I'm glad I got Rachel. She is my everything, and I love her. And I hope that many of you can find that person, your true godly person that you need in a biblical marriage and a biblical relationship now if you are a homosexual friend of mine or uh, someone that struggles with some of these lustful sins I love you and the plan of salvation is the same for you as it was for me you have to repent believe the gospel and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I'm not promising it won't be hard. And I'm not promising that you won't fall in sin and temptation. But I am promising that you will have a Savior that loves you and will forgive you. I want to show you a clip from a debate that Dr. Michael Brown had. And if you hadn't seen or listened to Dr. Michael Brown, go listen to him. 
He's a very smart uh, theological man. He has a PhD. He's a theologian. He has a PhD in Hebrew. He's a Jewish believer in Jesus. He's a continuationist like myself. He believes in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's more charismatic like I am. And uh, he's a good brother in the Lord. Um, and he goes, he has ministered to homosexuals. And listen, if you've fallen away, if you've, uh, about this on this degree, listen, I struggled with this because I compromised this issue with what I wanted my politics to look like. I wanted to be more moderate. I wanted to, I wanted to be more quote unquote libertarian in this one issue. And say it's up to them and God but I knew better and I'm thankful that God forgave me of that because our politics should reflect our personal relationship with Jesus now I don't believe in doing anything unconstitutional and I don't think Jesus is going to make you do anything really unconstitutional if you seek office and if you do resign and get someone else in there that can uphold the Constitution. And you pray that God will fix it. <laughs> um, but it comes down to this. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus asked his disciples, who am I? And Peter answered, you are the son of God. And Jesus is still asking that question to you. Who am I to you? Am I just someone you talk about when you go to church an hour and a half a week or an hour a week and you forget about me the rest of the week? Am I someone that you put up this imaginary wall between politics and me when I'm telling you to do this? And you're saying, God, I know, but the world says you're not invited here. Are you keeping him out? Of, uh, of that aspect of your life don't keep Jesus out of the voting booth don't keep Jesus out of the bedroom don't keep Jesus out of what you're looking on the web don't keep Jesus out of this because when we get Jesus somewhere else out that's when problems happen okay and I want to play you a clip from Dr. Michael Brown in a debate let me warn you this clip is a little bit longer it's going to be around six minutes so if you want to fast forward you can but i think it's very important and this is before the oberger failed decision with gay marriage and whatever you think about that it does make an impact and this is dr michael brown and the uh, beginning host is asking him a question and thank you very much is it advanced this question ends up with exactly that right okay so so, you know, I've, I've quoted in each of these. This time I want to quote not from the Bible, but from the Constitution of the United States. Here is part of the First Amendment to the Constitution, Article 1 of what we refer to as the Bill of Rights. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, that is... As, as has been noted, that's why you and other Christian conservatives have the right to define for yourselves what your religion is and means to you. To both preach and practice as you see fit without the state, without the government having any right to tell you what to do or what not to do. That's essential to a democratic society, right? But where in the Constitution does any religion, not, not just Christianity, but where does any religion get the right to people who are not members of that religion what they can and can't do. And doesn't, doesn't that fundamentally violate the constitutional separation of church and state? And if anyone is doing that, are they in fact violating the freedom that is guaranteed by the Constitution? And wouldn't, as I think Harry said earlier, preempting the question, but that's okay, doesn't that kind of a move in effect move the United States in the direction of being what's called a theocracy. A theocracy is a nation that is ruled by one religion rather than a democracy, a nation that is hopefully ruled by all the people. Another, another great question. So first, as a Jewish follower of Jesus, I, I know Jewish history decently well, and theocracies scare me. 
So I have no interest in theocracy. If anyone tells well, me we're sorry. going in that direction, I have to say fear tactic, nothing less, because that's not the direction that I'm going or advocating. And, of course, the Constitution and First Amendment don't actually speak of separation in church and state. That, that term, of course, comes from Thomas, and Je- Thomas Jefferson's letter to the, to the Baptists in the early 1800s. But True. let me tell you what I believe our role is. I'll quote Dr. Martin Luther King. The church must be reminded that it is not the master of the state or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. So first, I'm acting as a citizen. I have the right to act as a citizen, as does Harry, although I differ with the agenda of the human rights campaign, and and he would mine we both have the constitutional right we're not going to hurt kill attack each other so i'm going to seek what i can do to inform congress to vote accordingly to speak up to act etc in a non-violent not intimidating way in the spirit of christ but as a citizen i also realize that many of our laws are still based on biblical principles in other words the the law do not murder is not just a general society law It, it does come from scripture so There are certain laws that are based on biblical morality. I think that's great, but I'm not trying to enforce what Harry does in private. I'm not telling a couple they can't live together out of wedlock. They answer to God for that. However, if someone is in an abusive situation or or killing, murdering, so we have laws for that. I'm not trying to enforce my release on someone's personal life. However, I feel like I'm getting put in the closet, to be honest. I mean, in point, in fact, my feeling is you have, say, for example, the soul force equality writers that go to different Christian colleges and say, you don't have the right to forbid a practicing homosexual from being in your school if this person's professing Christian. Someone's telling me what I can and can't believe. There have been people arrested for, for messages that they sought to publish where they differed with homosexual practice. Uh, I quoted outspoken lesbian author Camille Paglia recently. And, uh, she, she made the comment that what bothers her is that the current gay and lesbian activism is so Stalin. That's what someone said from the inside. That's, that's, that's what I also face at times, that you've got people at work that have been forbidden from using the term natural family because it was considered to be hate speech. Uh, th- this happened in Oakland, California. It was held, held by the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. So my concern is that it's actually going the other direction. My concern is that another group is restricting what religious beliefs I can and can't hold. So let me repeat. I am not advocating for theocracy. I'm simply acting as a citizen, like everyone else, plain and simple, and to whatever extent I can inform the government, as Harry just said, be a prophetic witness, confront with moral issues, I'll do my best to do it within the realms of our democratic society, and that's it. Well said by Dr. Michael Brown. I don't want a theocracy. That word gets tossed around a lot, but I want Christians to vote like Christians in the legislature and as president acting as a Christian, um, you know, the left hate religion getting involved in politics. Unless it's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., they forget his title, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as he fought in the civil rights movement. Um, but I, I just want to read you all the First Amendment of the Constitution real quick because... So many people bring up separation of church and state. And just tell me um, if that is in this amendment at all, if that phrase is in this amendment as I read it. Okay, the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise therefore or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble, and to petition the government for a regarding of grievances. Let's read just one part of it again. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, comma, or prohibiting the free exercise, therefore, comma, Respecting the establishment, respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise. Therefore, they're saying we don't want an official church in the United States because it didn't work too well for us in England. That's all they're saying. They're not saying your personal beliefs 
can't influence the way you vote. The phrase separation of church and state is from a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist Association saying that they will be protected because the state is not going to be able to interfere with their religion. Um, but my task for you today is not to look at the gay LGBT flag in disdain, but look at it with a heart of love that we need to win these people to the gospel because their sin's no worse than ours. The, the only thing that's worse is that they haven't repented. So let's pray for them. Let's love them. Let's, uh, let's do everything we can for them. I don't want to go back to hating gay people like the church did and that was wrong, and that was sinful. Not all the church, but the church handled this sin wrongfully. We're going to love our gay brothers and sisters, if we have them, and we're going to love our gay relatives and our gay cousins and friends. But we're going to say, let's make you a brother and sister in the Lord. That there's a better way and there's a better life. And uh, a lot of LGBT people will say, you're not affirming my existence when it comes to transgenderism. I know you exist. I disagree that you are the gender you're claiming to be. I say this in love. I love you. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus is keen. Thank you to my... Um, technical support the love of my life rachel scott um if you want a good podcast to listen to tr try out the daryl mclean show if you want to give to this podcast to help us it is www.patreon.com slash over opinionated 679 the o and over is capitalized um and a big thank you to all my listeners please keep spreading the podcast Please um, keep praying. God bless you. God loves you. Serve your king, the Lord Jesus. And have a great day.